The Canadian Brass were founded in 1970. Two trumpets, a French horn, a trombone, and a tuba player. Forty-four years later, the group has been through numerous incarnations, but two things remain constant. They are still fantastic, and the tuba player is still Chuck Dellenbach. And we welcome the Canadian Brass, led by Maestro Dellenbach, <laughs> to TVO. It's good to have all you guys here. Thanks. And Chuck, yes. it's great to see you again, too, <laughs> if I may say. Take us back, because you're the one original member here of this thing still. So take us back 44 years. How did this come together? Well, we were all in Toronto, 1970, and uh, we like to say we were all standing in the unemployment lines. <laughs> and we met musicians. It's a small, a small group, and we shared our, our interests in not only brass playing, but if we could really create a chamber music ensemble that could make a living doing it. It was a wild dream at the time. And we just set about doing it. And pretty soon we gave up everything to do it, which you pretty well have to do when you're following your dream. How did you and, find uh, the original yeah. members? Well, Gene had been playing in the Toronto Gene Symphony. Watts. Gene Watts. Mm -hmm. He'd been the principal trombone in Toronto Symphony. And uh, he had gotten a little bit tired of sitting in the back row and thought he would like to get out front. So that was his uh, motivation. And uh, Graham Page was our original horn player. And he had actually had a business degree from University of Toronto, and music was uh, an avocation through, through college. But uh, he was very talented in Toronto at that time. They were looking for a horn player for the opera. Uh, and uh, he ended up as principal horn of the opera and doing the tours and so forth. Mm -hmm. So he was a freelance musician, and we just took him in. And then we had various trumpets, which is a recurring theme. We can talk about that. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. But we had a, a variety of trumpets until we hit upon the, the, the final two and uh, made our run. I've heard you guys described as kind of, uh, you know, the Marx Brothers with brass. <laughs> right. And in fact, Chris, do, do you want to show us uh, an example of the footwear that the Canadian brass is well known for? Well, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you guys don't exactly wear the patent leather shoes, do you? Yeah, these are comfortable, and uh, we can do anything in them, including even dance ballet if we need to. Even dance ballet. Well, this is the question. When at what point, or how did the decision get made that you weren't just going to be excellent musicians, you were going to be funny, too? I think our audiences told us that in their reactions. Uh, brass was certainly not a uh, conventional medium to, to try to, to uh, stake your, your career and future on. So when we got in front of audiences, they were quite curious. We could see right away that, the, for example, a little piccolo trumpet was quite unusual. We could see them just following that. So we started telling them about the horn. And then uh, we just got very comfortable talking to our audience. And one thing led to another. And, and uh, we just were ourselves on stage. And fortunately, some of the guys had some sense of humor and could share that with the audience. And the audience seemed to in, appreciate that. And we all know, if you've written, ele, written uh, I guess read elementary psychology that uh, any kind of reception of information is is better with positive and humor certainly makes it a more positive relationship and we we found that that actually enhanced the performance so one thing led to another and we couldn't be stopped. Did not you ever have any concerns that the very proper music critic for the New York Times, for example, <laughs> might not find this stuff amusing and you wouldn't be taken seriously as musicians. Well, actually, it was the New York Times critic that did not take us seriously. Well, there was, there was, there was, really, uh, there was no um, standard to be judged by. So being taken seriously or not taken seriously, we felt it was really up to us to uphold the standard. We created the brass standard. So it was for the critics to catch up rather than us catching up to a musical scene. It put us in a nice place, really. Looking back, uh, it, it made us kind of uh, impervious to, to criticism. Well, you're you know, utterly unique, <laughs> if, if unique yeah. is allowed to be modified, right, right. which I don't think it is, but, right. but you were and are. <laughs> Let's meet the guys. Uh, Chris Coletti, we already know what kind of shoes you wear. <laughs> you're from New York. How did you end up in this outfit? Oh, man. Well, I was a student of the Canadian Brass in California some years back, and um, I guess you could tell me if it's true or not. I, I guess they sort of remembered me from that. It was the hair. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was the guy with the high voice, but um, <laughs> more on that later, I guess. Um, and and a, a previous trumpet player actually called me to, to play duets. We were Juilliard students together, and uh, I thought it was just a casual thing. Trumpet players do this. I don't know if you guys do that, you low brass folks, but trumpet players get together a lot and play duets. And I found out later that it was essentially my audition 
uh, going through this sort of um, getting to know each other. Mm. And when he asked me if I would record on one of the Canadian Brass CDs, that was apparently my one of the final rounds. And uh, it was just the most thrilling thing. I, I always say that I never thought I'd even meet the Canadian Brass, let alone you know, be one. Be, be one. So, <laughs> Isn't that cool? And it's just as thrilling as it was when I started. So Let's talk to your other trumpet colleague over there, Caleb Hudson. Oh. You're from New York, uh, yep. Chris. Caleb, you're from Lexington, Kentucky. That's right. OK. How did you get into this outfit? Um, well, similar to Chris, I went to Juilliard as well with, with Chris. And uh, when they were looking for a new trumpet player, Chris also asked me to play duets, disguising that as uh, <laughs> you know, friendly hangout. But mm -hmm. that was indeed my first round of the audition. And then after that, I shortly met the other guys a week later and had to memorize a two-hour show <laughs> in about two weeks. <laughs> And then, uh, how does one actually do that? Uh, well, I didn't let myself out of the apartment for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Same way you get to Carnegie Hall, I guess. Yeah, right. Practice, yeah, practice, yeah, practice. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay, Caleb. Okay, Achilles, the Armacopolis, nice. originally from Athens, Greece. You're the trombone guy. Yeah. How did you make it into this outfit? Well, um, <laughs> f about four years ago, I received an email from one of the members in the Canadian Brass asking if I would like to audition for the group. You know, for me, that was only asking me to do this. That was incredible because I grew up with all these, with all the Canadian brass recordings and their books in my home country in Greece. And I was listening to these recordings n literally nonstop. So uh, I went to New York to do the audition and, and I guess they liked what they heard <laughs> and I ended up and here, here you are. Amazing, yeah. A and dream coming true. How many years ago was that? That was almost four, four years ago. Four years ago. Chris, how many years are you in? I guess just over five. Over five years? Caleb? Well, almost two now. Two for you. And let's meet Bernard Scully, French horn player from Champaign, Illinois. That's where I live currently. That's where we are now. Where are you from originally? Minnesota. Minnesota? Oh, okay. Why am I not surprised? And I went to this school in Wisconsin. This guy. <laughs> from, <laughs> went, you went to school in Wisconsin? Madison. Yeah. Which is Chuck's home province, yeah. state, whatever. <laughs> How did you make it into this? Well, it's kind of interesting. It was a while ago. Was it like 10 years ago? Yeah. Almost exactly 10 years ago. I um, was just at my house. My wife and I were newly married, and I got a call from, I think it was Gene. Gene called me and he says, oh, hi, this is Gene Watts. Uh, we need a horn player. Are you interested in addition? And I thought, first thought, like, okay, Gene Watts, Kenny Brass, that's the first thing. <laughs> Kenny Brass, like they need an extra horn player for an extra show. I, I wasn't processing the fact that they were actually asking about the real yeah. horn job, you know, <laughs> and then they're asking me if I'd be interested in auditioning. And so I'm thinking, like, just trying to work through all these things. And finally I said, well, uh, yes, of course, I'd like to audition. And he said, okay, well, can you, can you come down on Saturday? It was, I think, Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, I think you guys were playing a concert with the Philadelphia Orchestra at Verizon Hall. And um, so I, I mean, what are you going to say? No. So I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'll, come, I'll come up on Saturday. So I took an early flight, flew to Philadelphia, and I asked him, well, what, what, what should I play? You know, what, what do you guys want me to play? And I said, well, we'll have you read with the quintet, uh, maybe play some of your solo things. I've been doing a lot of solo competitions and things. So I brought all this music with me. and. Um, I think had lunch with you guys, then sat down, read with the quintet for two days. It was a pretty, pretty intensive, exhaustive audition process. And they said, "Well, we're listening to a few other players, so we'll let you know in a couple of days after I was done." And uh, sure enough, they called me a few days later and said, "We'd like to have you in the group." And uh, so I had about a month to learn all my music. And, <laughs> just, <laughs> and there you go. Yeah, that that's it. And then and then actually I. I left the group for a while. We, we had our, our first uh, baby, um, I guess it was seven years ago. You and, and Chuck? <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's something, we'll get into that later. <laughs> I, I got confused baby. for a second, sorry about that. Yeah, We're close in this group, I mean, <laughs> uh, my wife and I. And so uh, another opportunity came up, which was just, I, I just thought, you know, being on the road at that time maybe wasn't, you know, I just wanted to be home a little more, so I did that. And then this past year, um, although I had come back and sub with you guys a number of times, I was very fortunate to be able to do that and had, had remained in contact with the group to some degree and then they they said well you know we have another horn opening what, what do you think 
And I was, I was kind of blown away. I thought, this can't be happening. Like, this is... You I get, thought I get, you were Pacino for a second. Every uh, time I think I'm out, they suck me. <laughs> 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 right? yeah. yeah, sort of the, the nice version of that. But uh, Well, let me find out from uh-huh. Chuck. Uh, you know, uh, when you have a vacancy, does it require kind of four votes from the other guys on uh, who the new so. guy is? Very much so. Yes? You need yeah. unanimity in that. And more than that, it needs, particularly with trumpets, they need to pick each other. That's such an a, a important uh, relationship because one trumpet is playing the first part and the other guy has to support that. And they usually support it very well because they know the next piece, they're on top and they need to be supported. And mm-hmm. it becomes a very special relationship. So it's very important that trumpets uh, see eye to eye, up and down, 100%. Um, and then it is a conversation, and it, there's lifestyle involved. You know, it's great. It, great players are everywhere now, today. I mean, it's amazing, a plethora of wonderful players. But a wonderful player who's also a wonderful person is really important. And we do live very close together, touring and so forth. And you can't have uh, four guys that are like us and then suddenly have one that carouses and stays out all night and drinks and does all this. You, it just wouldn't fit. It wouldn't work. So it, you do need a cohesive uh, a band of, of friends. Because so. that would be encroaching on your turf. That's really your thing, isn't it? That's <laughs> <laughs> your job. <laughs> uh, speaking of the two trumpets, that's interesting. Chris, let me get you to follow up on that. As much as you guys have to be on the same page and in sync and all of that, for the reasons Chuck just described, mm. I would assume there's kind of a friendly, competitive relationship between the two of you as well. Yes? Yeah, I wouldn't even use the word competitive because, I mean, really, I mean, I, at least this is the way I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb may say something else. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and it goes for all the members in the group, like, the better he does, the better we all look, and the better I, the better I look. It's, if he plays really well, that doesn't make me look bad, that makes me look great. And it, the, if, if I play really well, that makes him look great. So it's, it's I've actually... Um, I guess I really never thought about it, but I could see why you might think from the outside that the trumpet players, they're the two, uh, the only instrument that's doubled, that you'd have competition, but it, and especially trumpet players, I know that's the stereotype where you've got uh, this competitive nature, but really uh, never f- once felt that. I, I think it's a support system, and you need, you need each other to sound great, otherwise it would be a quartet. Okay, let's see so, what he says. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your view on that? Yeah, we don't fight about who takes the first part, we fight about... The easy part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to make our lives as easy as possible. But you do want to be better than him, don't you? Uh, <laughs> Isn't yeah. there a part of you that thinks about that? <laughs> uh, I'm no going comment. for the controversy. Here. Let's, go. Yeah, Let's get it on the table now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not going to let, let up on that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> not, not as long as you've got that awkward smile on your face. No. <laughs> well, okay. Well, here's one thing I do know Caleb did. <laughs> That Chris did not do. You produced. You produced this video, right? That was shot in Brooklyn. Oh, I, I was in the process. Yes, you one were, of the producers. You were one of the producers. Right. Well, it says on the credits that you produced it. So I think you're just being <laughs> oh, okay. modest. But we'll see. <laughs> let's do. Uh, let's see some of you guys in action. Okay. This is Amazing Grace, as you've never heard it before. Roll tape. My first question is obvious. Uh, why does the tuba player get such a solo in this piece? <laughs> I mean, he does get enough attention, don't you think? It's in the contract. I it's get in the contract. I Ten see. seconds every tune. <laughs> that was, I mean, I've got to tell you, that was just brilliant. Uh, 
How does all that come together? Can I ask you? I mean, you are the produ you did produce the video on this, right? Sure. So yeah. can I ask you about this? Sure. How the, how all that that's an outdoor concert in Brooklyn, New York, and how does that happen? Uh, well, quite last minute actually. Uh, we're all together rehearsing, and we just decided uh, last minute to make a video. And Amazing Grace was something that we had been rehearsing for upcoming shows. I think that was just coming off of a European tour. Mm -hmm. So we'd been playing it all across Germany and, uh, and Switzerland and what was the third country? Netherlands, that's right. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, Chris really wanted a feature, so we decided to. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you, you were a bit of a peacock in that number, you got to admit, right? <laughs> You're out there. Well, that was my backyard. I felt it was that's my home, right, that's it was my home turf. <laughs> yeah. So you got to claim sort of the home ice advantage on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I exactly. I'll stand here in the middle. And you guys can just sit back there in the bushes. <laughs> how does, Chuck, maybe you can help mm. us on this. How, you're obviously the original, and these guys came later. So the assumption mm. might be that you sort of are first among equals. You know, they may have one boat, but you may have <laughs> six boats. How do you make decisions? Does it work like that? Well, we try to keep two things uh, a little bit separate. I'm, there is a business component that just naturally is in place, and the guys are gradually becoming part of that. It's not an overnight process. But as far as when we're playing, uh, what I've hoped for, and they'll either corroborate this or tell you quietly it's not like this, but it really <laughs> is a, a cooperative venture. In music, you can't have uh, somebody with some kind of a veto. You just can't make wonderful music if you're not cooperating and really working it out. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of chamber music. I mean, it, it, sports is way ahead of us on this. If you don't have a team working, you can't have one guy out on the floor telling everybody what to do. It's not going to work very long. So Achilles, <clears throat> if you have a piece of music that you are in love with and you really want to have it be on either the next album or part of the next concert, can you do that? Uh, I can talk about it every day until I convince them to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and is that what happens? Uh, sometimes, I think, yeah. yeah, but the thing is that the other members have to like it too, yeah. or at least most of them, well, so we can convince, convince the rest. That's the right guy. Uh, Achilles <laughs> has really become our, our historian. Although I was present at the time, you, you know the, the thing of, uh, if you remember the 60s, you weren't really there. Yeah. It's like, you, you know, I, I don't really remember these things that we did. Achilles reminds us, he knows all of our recordings, he knows every piece, and he knows, he'll know differences of pieces where we've recorded to. And he has very much influenced repertoire on some of our new, new albums. So we have pieces here that he's reminded us, uh, our tango piece, for example, he said, you know, you guys haven't recorded that. Huh. And uh, so we pulled that out, and sure enough, we recorded it, and he's very much uh, part but of that. But it sounds process. like if you like something, it's, it, it's political in a way. You have to lobby the other guys to get the majority <laughs> of the votes. Is that how it works? I guess we just have to play the piece, and if we like it, and if this is a reason. For example, there is this piece on one of our latest recordings, Killer Tango. Have I, is, uh, it, is it one of these ones? No. Uh, it's okay. on we'll get to that in a second. Third, third latest recording. Third latest recording. <laughs> and uh, this is a piece, for example, that I was playing as a student. Uh, and I was always surprised that the Canadian Brass hadn't recorded. So when I first joined, the first thing I asked Chuck, I was like, you know this piece, right? Killer Tango by Sony Kompanek. What do you think of playing this piece? Oh, and Chuck says, oh, that's a great idea. And actually that became kind of a hit. I mean, especially mm -hmm. since I joined, I think we're playing it constantly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. How many members of the group have there been since day one? Do you know offhand? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not important. <laughs> 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 no, I guess I don't really know the number. There's only been one tuba player. And that's right. That's uh, you. Uh, three trombones. Uh, Over the last 44 years, three trombones. 44 years. Okay. Uh, now, French horns gets more complicated. There's probably been six. I think six. Yeah. yeah. And then trumpets. <laughs> Lots. Yeah, hundreds. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's no, Ron hundreds. and Fred were our originals, and they were, gosh. 30, Ronnie, Ron, and Fred Mills. 30 years. Yeah. Uh, 30 years sort of each. And then uh, it took the 10 years. It really did take time to find you know, the team. So uh, it, it was, it's a process, for sure. Is there? Okay, let's go to, I'm going to, Bernard, I'm going to ask you first, and then we'll go around on this one. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
it's pretty obvious that he's the original and you guys are the kids, if I can put it that way, right? <laughs> Is there a generation gap on this group? You know, I, you might think so from the outside, but if you get to know Chuck, I mean, Chuck is one of the most fun-loving, approachable people, fair people I've ever met. And I, I feel like it, whatever age difference there is, I don't feel any sort of um, a gap, if, if you're going to use that term. You know, I, is that because he's so immature? He's like <laughs> 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 Only in the best ways. <laughs> well, you're in your 30s. Mm -hmm. The rest of you are in your 20s. Mm -hmm. And Chuck? Yeah, I'm definitely older, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> does that, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking to stir up some trouble here. Is that ever, is that ever an issue? I, I don't know that it's an issue. I mean, it certainly is. It's for real. I mean, there's no question. Uh, I think it, it was pretty well hidden until my hair went gray. That, that <laughs> sort of, you know, that, that kind of tells it. But uh, music, again, music is not a, an age sensitive. It's, it's not like basketball. Um, you know, it, I think I would have already been 30 years out of the group had this been a sports team. Fortunately, uh, it's music, and music, uh, it, it's something that age doesn't hinder. It should help. It really should help. But is there ever a moment where you think, look at guys, I, this ain't my first rodeo. I've been down this road before. You have to trust me on this. I know better. Do you have well, those moments? Well, there are some things, absolutely. When you, when you realize that the agency we work with, for example, the, our agents who are wonderful, but they're probably early 30s themselves. Hmm. I've seen more of the business than they have. And I've seen it in its heyday. You know, I was around, uh, HEROC had just closed up and we had the HEROC team was our management team. Hmm. And we were at RCA Records when Tom Shepard, who was the uh, uh, Philadelphia Orchestra, Ormandy's producer, Bernstein's producer, hmm. was our producer. Uh, I was there. So there's no denying that I have seen some things, but what I try to avoid, really definitely try to avoid is, I've seen that already. I'd rather see what's new. If it's only as good as I can see, it's not gonna be enough to take them forward. Gotcha. It's gotta be much, a much more brilliant picture. This is actually not meant to be a controversial <laughs> stirring up trouble right. question, but uh, of all the brass members over the years, there's never been a woman. Is there a reason oh, yes, for there that? there was. Oh, definitely. There was. There was? Actually. Yes. Okay, I missed that. Actually, a very valued uh, colleague and uh, uh, is Manon LaFrance in uh, Montreal, hmm. and she is now the director of the uh, conservatoire huh. in Montreal. What years was she in the group? Um, roughly 2007, 2008, 2009. Huh. And huh. she's on uh, about four of our recordings. Okay. Yeah. I stand corrected. <clears throat> Good. I'm glad. And she was French Canadian. Beautiful. Wow. What, what, more, what more can I say? Felicitations. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah. You guys did something. I want to go back in time now. You guys did something. Not you guys, actually. You. <laughs> <laughs> with, the old, with the other guys. 1977, an historic, first-of-its-kind trip to China. Roll tape. <laughs> That's 1977, and that's actually the new Canadian Brass, this group that you heard, although the picture's obviously from <laughs> back in the day. And Chuck, what am I looking at here? What's this CD? You've just brought this out. Brand new CD. Uh, by luck, we have uh, pretty much our own company, uh, recording company, uh, Canadian Indie, that's um, about 10 years old. And uh, that's something that I did start. I can say that because none of these guys were there at the time. Or, with, or alive, uh, maybe. Yeah, with my <laughs> wife, MB. Uh, she and I, she's a producer, and I guess I'm the, uh, what's the assistant to the producer? At any rate, uh, <laughs> it seemed time to do a tribute to the, the Chinese uh, trip. It's something that was on our mind forever. And uh, these guys did a, sh a fair bit of the writing for this, taking these tunes. And then a, an illustrious Canadian uh, name in music, Howard Cable, oh, yeah, sure. actually wrote half of these arrangements for us. <laughs> And the nice thing about Howard is he was around when we did the China tour, and he sent us off with music back then. And then to put him back to work on this was quite a, quite a treat. 
I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon mm. Osmond, to drop in some of those pictures of Chuck back in the day <laughs> from 1977. Look at this, Chuck. Look at the monitor here. That's you guys in 1977. I mean, that trip was just so ahead of its time at the time. Yeah. Uh, how did that all come together? Well, this put us on the international map, no question about it. It came about, it was um, then Prime Minister Trudeau had established a, a cultural exchange. And the idea was the Toronto Symphony was going to go to China, and then the, uh, the opera, the Beijing opera, White Hair Girl, was going to come here. And towards the last minute, the Chinese got cold feet. They hadn't had any Westerners in for 10 years, the Cultural Revolution. And they were quite concerned about a 150 people troop showing up. What are they going to do? And a very uh, sharp fellow, uh, Brian McDonald, was the cultural attache in China at the time. And he just blurted out, he says, I have an idea. Let's start with a small group as an experiment. And we were invited to go as the first lobby of this cultural exchange. And uh, uh, we even had a film crew. This, this is how tight it was. We had a film crew that wanted to, to accompany us, and the Chinese turned it down. They just didn't know how they would handle that. And, of course, Isaac Stern later came up with the, uh, I think it was Stern, a movie. It was only the next mm. year because our tour had been successful. Okay, well, bring a film crew in. <laughs> so uh, it was quite a time. We saw China in a way that uh, no, uh, it'll never be like that again, and no Westerner had seen it like that. We were right there at the... The, uh, just a story to show you how, how interesting a time it was. When we got down to the, uh, uh, I guess we're in Wuhan, sort of in the middle, they had a very nice hotel, a compound, gates, and we come through the gates and the people are waiting for us and they give us hand towels at the door to go in. And we go up and there's people busily working in the corridor of the hotel. They're running around doing whatever they do and there's somebody writing in the hall. And after we got settled in, we said, well, let's take a look around the hotel. And we went upstairs. It was about an inch thick dust. They had opened it up and made it look <laughs> like it was in full swing just for our visit. Wow. <laughs> As I show the camera, your latest, because it is Tis the Season after all. <laughs> you know, if you want to uh, zoom in on that, there we go, Kevin, thank you. Uh, tis the season for this kind of music, and <laughs> there, there's Chuck on his back, um, <laughs> slipping, sliding away, as per usual. Where's the, Chris, where's the, where's the one place you haven't played yet that you'd really love to play as an ensemble? Uh, well, I'd probably say somewhere in South America, maybe even Brazil. Um, our Facebook stats tell us that our biggest audience demographic, at least on Facebook and YouTube, is in is in South America. Huh. And uh, the only place that we've really played was, uh, I guess, Venezuela, Venezuela. for the El playing with the El Sistema. So we'd love to go to Brazil. We know we have fans there, and they, we know that they play all of our music, and we know that they listen to us, but we've never met them in person. So we th I think that's probably one. You want to do that, Achilles? Have you played Greece? Uh, the group has. The group has? Uh, with you in it? No. No, it was, it was actually only three or four years before I joined, so I missed it. You missed it. But would that be a, that would be That would be a, definitely a dream. You'd love to play to, yeah. for the Canadian bra brass in your home country. Yeah, that would be amazing. That would, that be, would nice. be pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How about you, Bernard? Maybe like Australia, New Zealand. I take yours? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you took Caleb's answer. I think we were going to go there once, but something happened. We didn't go. Well, it sounds like there's two votes for Australia. You get yeah. one more vote, maybe you're on the way. Everything's on the beach, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, Caleb, you? Well, my wife really wants to go to Hawaii, so yeah, mm. I would take that. I think the group was there recently, right? No, that was the Bahamas. I'll take that, too. You should figure <laughs> out. You should do Hawaii after Obama's presidency is over, when he is back there. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. That would be pretty. Do a, do a concert for him. Oh, sure. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> be, not, not that I'm giving you ideas here, but whatever. <laughs> have you ever done the White House? Uh, the White House, we have not. 24 Sussex. Um, yes. Yes. We were there on the grounds. I don't think they let us inside. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's see. We played, uh, well, we did the, the IMF several times. Hmm. Um, I was within feet of Kissinger, and I was about to give him my philosophy, and, and I don't know, just time just ran out. <laughs> I see. Are you going to ask me where I would like to play? Like, uh, well, I... Were you going to okay. ask that? I mean... Where, is it well, somewhere in Wisconsin, or where is it? Well, your wife wants to go to Hawaii. Well, my wife and I are really looking forward, and actually our dream is being fulfilled. It's actually booked. We're going to be playing in the new Burlington Center. <laughs> Burlington, Ontario, Canada. Absolutely. Awesome. It's exciting. When is that happening? It's in, I believe it's March, April. 
Yeah. Awesome. I'm yeah. going to come to that one because I, I can't get to Australia or Hawaii, but I think I can get to Will Burlington. Will you uh, do the introductions? In the? If, only oh, if you ask me. Fantastic. Only if you ask me. You're, you're asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, deal, deal. Uh, I, I notice you happen to have brought an instrument along with you today. No, it's right there on the floor. <laughs> would, would you, as they say, play us out with maybe a minute of something that um, you would enjoy doing? Well, I haven't got, this is, the guys have not given me a chance to play this. Back in the day, I used to play Flight of the Bumblebee, and it was my big showpiece. Yeah. And so if you don't mind, since I'm on my own, I could probably do that. Flight of the Bumblebee on tuba, Chuck <laughs> Delaback, <All> right. solo. <laughs> Just me. <laughs> That's it. Because, you know, if we were on stage. No, everybody, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got set up there. <laughs> well done, guys. That was great. Very, very good. Well played. I can't thank you enough for coming into TVO tonight and sharing your memories and your hopes of the future. And it's so great to see this ensemble still cooking with gas. The Canadian Brass. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.